On today's World Insight, we host a panel on recharging growth in China to discuss the state of China's economy and how to infuse consumer confidence. On our panel, we have Kevin Rudd, Australian Ambassador to the U.S., Belen Garijo, Executive Board Chair and CEO of Merck Pharmaceuticals, Jia Xiao Qian, Chairman of Hisense Group, Jin Ke Yu, economics professor at the London School of Economics, and Zhu Min, vice chairman of the China Center for International Economic Exchanges. When China talks about growth, the world listens. That's because a China opportunity means serious business, both in policy words and determined actions. So what will drive China's high quality economy? Catch Recharging Growth in China, a World Insight Special with Tian Wei from the World Economic Forum in Davos, a joint presentation of the WEF and CGTN. But the Chinese consumer is the best guarantor of China's economic future. 5.2% is not too bad. It shows the resilience of China's economy. Only on CGTN. Welcome to the session entitled Recharging Growth in China. My name is Tian Wei. I'm a moderator and host coming from uh, CGTN from China. Such a pleasure to see all of you here. Why not the challenges first so that everybody feel the questions in their mind can be addressed? Um, what exactly is the state of China's economy to you? Well, I think the growth is 5.2 percent. It's not too bad. It showed the resilience of China's economy. If you go down to the details, you will say the consumption actually increased uh, 6.1 percent. It's quite strong. Actually, the, the capital investments is only 5 percent, not as strong as we expected. But it is good because we want to mark a consumption pick up. Exports is weak, you know, only almost zero growth for last year, which which was the main growth engine for China. Um, so if you see the whole thing, you, you can see the structure change underway, and, but support overall the growth. Um, I think that's the picture I'm reading for Chinese economy today. But when you mention the, the, the challenges, I think basically Chinese economy is facing two challenges. One is the cyclical challenges. Because after 30 years of strong growth, the growth is slowing down, obviously. All right? you have a, aging populations, you have a lower productivities, and you have the structure change, all those things. So you would not expect China to have a super strong 10% of growth, right? I mean, you cannot do that. But more on the structure issue. The Chinese economy previously is more driven by three key drives. One is infrastructure investments, which always account more than 50% of GDP. Mm -hmm. The second is real estate, and really grow strongly. And the third is export. Now, those three things are all gone because the return on infrastructure structure is so low is number one. The last year, the real estate investments was a negative 9.1%. The, the real estate sales is a 1.1 billion square meter. It's a huge number, 1.1 billion square meter, but still dropped 8.1% compared with even a year ago. So the real estate is a still a big economy, but not a growth engine. It's gone in terms of growth. The exports used to be very strong. 2022, China have a 3 percentage of GDP growth, 2 percentage point from net exports. But last is a zero. So all those gone. So what is our new? We have to find a new growth engine. So new growth engine basically comes from domestic consumption, digitalized manufacturing, and the carbon neutrality transformation. Mm -hmm. I think this reason will support Chinese growth in medium and even long term. Well, first of all, booms and busts is a natural feature of market economies. In the last 40 years, China has really never had a bust. So bust cycles also oust less productive firms and provides exit me mechanisms. And that creative destruction, I think, is one of the bright spots of, of, um, of, the, of the situation. 
Look, you know, China's suffering from a severe deficit in demand because of low wage growth, scarring effects of the pandemic, and of course, the real estate. Um, but I just want to say, because of China's size today, growing at 3 to 4% even is not a bad thing. If India grows 4 percentage points faster than China from now until 2030, China is still going to contribute $130 trillion of additional GDP, more than India will uh, to the world. Now, briefly, um, I totally agree with um, uh, uh, Mr. Zhu's assessment of transitioning to a productivity, innovation-driven economy. That's the only way that's going to sustain sustain growth in the long run, so that's a good thing. But guess what? You know, renewables or digitization, in the short term, it can't possibly displace real estate as a provider for growth and employment in the way that it had in the last 10 years uh, or so. Second, services. Right now, it only accounts for half of GDP and only 48% of employment. That number is 80% in advanced economy. So you can imagine a whole amount of room uh, for also absorb, absorbing the youth uh, who are underemployed, highly educated. They account for more uh, educated skill force than manufacturing. And you also have almost a billion people who haven't really reached middle income by international standards, living under $300 uh, per month. So I can go on and on. When even Japan and Korea leveled off their growth, their productivity as a share of GDP, as, as a share of the U.S., was already 80 percent, and China is still very low. So a lot of room for convergence. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to separate the cyclical problems of demand from some of the longer-term challenges. We heard uh, from the speech uh, given by Chinese Premier. He talked about the size of the Chinese econ economy, uh, the market, still attractive. And meanwhile, talking about the continuous consultation with the global companies, if I remember right, about uh, government procurement and also uh, the flow of data, uh, just to say a few examples. How do you see these kinds of uh, uh, policy attitudes vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, your concerns and also your plans for the future of your company in China? Look, we continue to, uh, to uh, operate under a China for China strategy. That means we are extremely well placed to, to serve the needs of our customers and, 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 and to serve the patients uh, in China through our life science, healthcare and electronics uh, business uh, sectors. So, um, look, just to take an example um, um, of the biopharma business, mm. Uh, which is also having a very positive impact on the prospects that we see for, for our life science business. Uh, China today is uh, uh, managing 22% of the global R&D, following the US with uh, 27%, uh, and followed by Japan with only 7%. So the, the, the uh, booming of uh, biotech and research in China, the booming of new technologies is, is for, a, for a company like ours uh, a tremendously attractive opportunity. Uh, we operate, uh, as I mentioned, with, uh, with a uh, significant presence. We have 5,000 employees in China. We have several uh, factories, innovation hubs. But we, uh, we uh, rely also on trust-based partnerships with uh, local companies to be able to, uh, to, uh, to accelerate our contributions to customers and patients, mm -hmm. and, and most importantly, to, to continue to contribute to our global growth and resilience. You mentioned the word uh, trust. Uh, that is a very tempting word. We're going to let everybody talk about that uh, a bit later, I guess, also related to the economy. Let me now go to the Chinese entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Jia, sitting here. How do you feel the temperature of the Chinese economy where you are? Twenty twenty three was a very difficult year, not just for us, but also for our counterparts outside China. Now maintaining five point two percent economic growth was a real positive surprise for us. The government has made a lot of efforts in very different areas to support companies. So as the companies can have high quality development and Hisense had a growth rate of 10% last year, and the profits reached 11%. So we can see it has done better than the national average. 
And also, we have had growth at the global level as well as at the local level. The growth has reached the double-digit figures. So right now, what companies need is an open market. And also, it has to be a market-led and market-based economy. Also, we need stable industrial and supply chains. We see an interesting phenomenon. On the one hand, global companies are operating, working, uh, establishing your business in China for the Chinese market in competition with the Chinese companies, but also at the same time in cooperation with the Chinese companies. And at the same time, for the overseas market, you're also competing and working together with your Chinese uh, counterparts if you look at the supply chain and many other factors. So how does that fascinating, sophisticated relationship work? And how is it happening right now within this current atmosphere of the Chinese economy? I think, I think this is perfectly compatible. Look, you know, I mean, we, we uh, uh, as a company, as a science and technology company who is, which is operating globally, we consider a very significant element of our resilience and, and future growth, uh, global diversification. And, 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 and in that context, we, of course, rely on our on our own internal portfolio, which we develop in China. I mentioned that already in, in uh, uh, biopharma, delivering essential medicines, uh, um, in life science, in which we serve biotech and pharma customers, which is a, a very promising uh, uh, growth uh, avenue. Mm. And, and also in electronics for many years, uh, uh, working on display, liquid, liquid crystals, displays, and now also on semiconductors materials. So uh, relying on our organic resources and allocating capital and investing capital in China is, is definitely uh, very complementary with, uh, with uh, uh, partnering with, uh, uh, with high, um, uh, highly prestigious pharma, company, uh, pharma and biotech companies in China to to, to increase our impact in the local and international markets because we are also relying on, on some of these uh, um, emerging innovation and, 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 and expanding biotech in China to uh, support companies to commercialize products outside of China, new mm. products outside of China, which is, which is a win-win for both parties, right? So we have announced several deals in the last few months uh, in which we have been licensed uh, new uh, uh, modalities for treatment of cancer mm -hmm. or, or other chronic diseases from China partners. So I think this is very, very complementary. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we do it in a very, uh, and it increases not only the local impact in the, in the, in the market, but also uh, our global growth opportunity overall. While Hisense is a manufacturing company, it's also a traditional home appliances company. And through our development, we have realized that competition is a core characteristic of the market. You all know that in 1992, China started the reform in opening up, and then China also became a member of the WTO. And over the last four decades, China has gone through a lot of changes. And also we have learned to accept challenges. And by accepting these challenges, we have also learned from other companies, from foreign companies. And we have also learned how the world market economy works. And I think this has been very helpful for us. Ambassador Rod, you have been listening attentively to your fellow panelists.
We know that you have been observing China from near and afar for decades. Uh, one of the uncertainties we all know for this uh, interesting year 2024 is geopolitics and how it's related to both the internal political agendas of different countries and their interactions. When you are looking at our topic today, the state of Chinese economy, recharging growth, uh, how are you looking at it from where you are, Mr. Ambassador? Good. The, um yeah, I first went to work in China probably 40 years ago this year, so I've seen a few things. Um, and the comments earlier about boom and bust and about structural and cyclical factors, uh, I have observed and analysed over four decades. We are, however, I think in quite unique circumstances today. And in large part, that's because of the overhang of, let's call it, geopolitics and the real world of the economy. <coughs> Second point I'd make is um, uh, when I um, see, uh, and these are my personal views, I'm, not represent I'm a China analyst, I'm not representing a government here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my day job. I'm here at uh, uh, Davos having a conversation uh, as best I can analyse the questions that we are confronting. Yeah. But I've never really accepted the thesis that you see written in various parts of the world about peak China. Uh, that somehow the uh, Chinese economy is peaking, uh, slowing, and then heading towards something worse. <clears throat> and the reason I analyse it in those terms is because you don't have to have been to China hundreds of times over, the, over 40 years to conclude that the Chinese consumer is the best guarantor of China's economic future. So long as the Chinese consumer has confidence in the future, uh, then the economy will continue to grow reasonably well. That's a core fact. And remember, the scale of the Chinese consumer market is uh, unprecedented in global economic history. But the Chinese consumer, uh, while I don't accept uh, peak China at all, I think it's intellectually and analytically flawed because of uh, the untapped potential of Chinese consumer demand. The Chinese consumers had a rough time in recent years. They, like the rest of us, had to endure the pandemic uh, since then, um, you've seen the property market, which represents 28% of GDP, go through unprecedented tumult. And if you've had your savings tied up in property investment, then frankly you're in negative uh, investment territory. If you're in the equity market trying to make some money, putting your savings aside and then earning some more cash, guess what? China's equity markets have performed poorly as well. So the poor old Chinese consumer, frankly in my judgement, Thinking about the future, these factors together with youth unemployment, uh, which continues to be problematic, is feeling a bit battered. And so the key question for the future is the restoration of Chinese domestic consumer confidence, because that is China's best long-term guarantee and lies at the heart of Chinese economic policy in the dual circulation economy model. Last point, business confidence. <laughs> Uh, when we've had uh, at this conference before Vice Premier Liu He uh, tell us and tell the Chinese domestic audience about the central importance of the Chinese private sector. 60% of GDP, 90% of innovation, 60% uh, plus of Chinese taxation, 70% uh, of uh, new employment uh, creation. The future confidence of the private sector in China is of fundamental importance like that of Chinese consumers. and. Chinese uh, business confidence has taken a battering in recent years as well. So the real question for Chinese policymakers is how do you actually deal with these two confidence equations? Concluding point, trade. Are we on the cusp of seeing the emergence of a completely bifurcated global economy? That is competing supply chains across the board, not just at the high end, of technology and semiconductors. You've seen the semiconductor war between China and the United States but through other technology categories, through to general manufacturing, which became a red hot concern in the West uh, during the pandemic when everyone became concerned that having consigned all of their manufacturing to the Chinese growth factory of the future, that, so they couldn't get access to what they needed at a time of crisis. And then thirdly, on basic things such as critical minerals, is this turning into a bifurcated global order as well? And that's where geopolitics
has this potential to pull the floor from underneath our historical growth models. So in answer to your question, what are the challenges, that would be my set. Consumers, business confidence, geopolitics and trade bifurcation. Mm. What you said is one <coughs> word about confidence. <coughs> Whether it's consumer confidence, business confidence, or confidence about the latest trends of the global order uh, or global interaction. About that, uh, I want to have our economists to respond from their perspective and then <coughs> later go to uh, the business uh, uh, representative here as well. Uh, Professor Jin, first, please. Confidence has to come from somewhere, right? There are underlying factors that alter confidence and consumption. And of course, um, we've seen the scarring effects of the pandemic. Don't forget that Chinese households did not get the support that European American households got during the pandemic. But more importantly, wage growth could be declining. We don't really know for sure, but it's not climbing. So without that, you can't possibly get consumption to be really quite uh, enthusiastic. Of course, there's real estate and the stock market. Again, retail uh, investors account for the majority of the turnover for Chinese A shares. And so that has also been performing uh, uh, problematically. And of course, youth unemployment um, is, uh, is a challenge. But is it coming from a cyclical a feature, which is a demand deficit, in which case policies could potentially work. But, you know, as we'll hear from Mr. Zhu, there are also constraints, right? There's a debt overhang on local governments. Local governments were the key implementers of economic drivers of growth. But now they are suffering from mountainous uh, uh, debt burdens. So these are some of the, the kind of uh, short-term challenges. Coming back to the trade challenges, we're seeing in the data that trade is simply being rerouted. It's being rerouted from countries like Vietnam and Mexico. But guess who the ultimate demand and suppliers of that trade is? It's still the US and China. It's going from a longer, taking a longer route, and that's gonna increase trade cost. And uh, Chinese, uh, some Chinese companies, from what I learned, have also set up factories in Mexico and, of course, in Vietnam to kind of circumvent some of these uh, regulatory, um, some, circumvent some of these um, trade barriers. But it still has to come ultimately from countries like the US and China. Mm. About the business side, uh, Mr. Jia, you were moving as a state-owned company uh, uh, executive to now a mixed ownership company executive. So when it comes to business confidence, I see from uh, Ambassador Ra's question, uh, there's indication about uh, how about private entrepreneurs? How are they being honored about their contributions? What is your understanding of the latest uh, Development. Last year, hundreds of regulations issued by various governing bodies encouraging private business. That has given us signals which enhance trust in the development prospects of private businesses. Hisense, we operate on a fully corporate footing now. So in sectors like ours, it's the same for us as for other private businesses. We operate under market forces. We try to achieve an edge through better technology and innovation and just managing ourselves better as a company. From that point of view, last year and the year before, with difficulties in the real estate sector and there was a bit of a crisis in monetary terms, but what we see as also a challenge with lack of consumer confidence that has been turned around by the adoption of various macroeconomic control policies and I think that is going to rebuild consumer confidence. I want to go to Dr. Zhu Min to respond to also to the earlier interactions among your fellow panelists. If you're looking for the data, last year consumption increased 7.1 percent compared with 5.2 percent GDP growth, which is good. So that means consumption confidence is back. The real issue is not the consumption growth, it's the overall Chinese consumption level is low compared to the GDP shares, which is a historical issue. So China needs to continue to work very hard to boost the share of consumption in the total GDP. Currently only roughly a little bit of more than 50%, which is way low. So I think that's the issue, but there are many things you can do. The fiscal policy needs most money on safety nets, as Kevin mentioned. I think this is important. And also the wage increase is also important. Um, but many important issues, there's still 
150 million people living in the city without what we call the city ID, hooker issues. So speed up the reform on the uh, residential ID issue will boost the consumption in a big way. We expect to see another 150 million people moving to the city in the next 20 years. So grants is a 300 million people consumer power, give them city ID is very important. Good news is indeed the government speed up the whole thing. So I think the consumption issue is the growth is strong, but the level relatively low, it will take a long time. Mm. The private sector confidence has also picked up. I see that they are doing good on something, on trade issues. China trade last year is a 0.2% growth, almost a zero, as I mentioned. But private sector uh, on trade issues is 6.3% growth. So private sector, the share in the total trade increases 3.1 percentage point. That's mean previously they only account the 50%. Now they account the 53.1%. So private sector responds to the global environment change very fast. So I think that's a good. Could you mention one thing, so whether the green transformation will be able to meet the growth need? I think this is indeed is an issue. It's a we, critical issue. Yeah, we, we saw the, the green sector grow strongly, EV, batteries, you know, it's all fantastic, right? But scale is a big issue. So in that sense, the government will continue to put an amount of money into the green infrastructure. So this year, we roughly estimate the Chinese authority will invest so 10 trillion RMB in the green infrastructures, uh, digital energies, the digital facilities, the data sets, <coughs> and the power system, digital power systems, um, to f facilitate on um, the, the green transformation, also to avoid uh, overinvest in road and the bridge. So they will try to, because 10 trillion RMB will provide very strong growth support for the whole economy. Following up on what you said, uh, uh, we love uh, the Chinese uh, economic policies which always come out as in PowerPoints. There's four new, as they say, uh, new technology, new infrastructure, new investment, and new consumption. That's the four new. Earlier, we also heard the PowerPoints coming from the Chinese Premier talking about the green development. There seems to be also a long list of uh, uh, possible new green initiatives. So how Will these policies work with the question that all of you critically ask, whether it is enough to gear up the Chinese economic growth? I want to ask also uh, the uh, business leaders here. You know, in my view, China is, 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 is getting closer and closer to, to a developed market yeah. at this time for, for, for healthcare, for life science. So something which is very critical uh, is uh, the uh, consistency and predictability of the regulatory environment. Uh, we as a company has been extremely active on portfolio management and today one of the uh, uh, potential constraints and limitations that we encounter when, it, when we think of inorganic moves is uh, um, regulatory constraints related to uh, potential national security issues. I think this is something that has to be very uh, promptly addressed so we can be playing and operating globally. I think okay. the, the other one, and I need to mention this one because it's super important, is the intellectual property uh, protection and the reward to innovation in China. All right. I think you mentioned some very important keywords. Trust, confidence, and transformation. Really appreciate it for your efforts. And thank you so much also for everyone's uh, contribution. This is the joint session between CGTN and World Economic Forum. I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching. Bye.